Okay, I can see myself. Can you see yes, me? Um, yes, we can see you and we can hear you. And do you also have some slides to present? Yes, I do. So let me see. Okay, let's see if I can see. Ah, Firefox idiocy. Um, a Chrome might be working better. Okay, let's do Chrome then. Sorry for that. Everything works. No, no worries. I want to share my screen. No worries. Let's wait for a moment for Eric is sorting out the browsers. And in the meantime, um, you are still welcome to send any questions through the chat for Patricia and Terry, because ah. we're going to have a new... Okay, now we are back. on smiley face. I'm back, and I think I can probably just share my screen. Yes, please. That's what I wanted to. And share. Um, well, now we have this thing. Uh, uh, you can... OK, thank you. Stage is yours. OK. OK, thank you very much. OK. Glad I managed this, finally. Um, hello, welcome everybody. My name is Erik Wilde. I'll be talking about mastering API governance, governance with insights, interfaces, and nudging. So I want to talk about how to manage API programs, platforms, landscapes, all these things. And I want to talk about it from the standpoint of large organizations that often go through this path of originally having like a more centralized IT idea and setup and culture and what it takes to move away from that and why it sometimes can be a little daunting and maybe also a little intimidating to, to do that. But also I want to share some patterns, what you can do so that it works better. Very briefly about Myself. Oh, and by the way, in the chat, I posted a link to the slides. So if you want to look at the slides, I've linked a couple of things from my slides. If you want to look at the slides online, then you can just follow that link. The slides are browser-based, so you can just look at them and follow along or look at them later on. OK, so my name is Erik Wilde. I am working for Xway, software company. I'm mostly... Um, I would say I'm mostly concerned with the API management things that we do. We also do some other things, but API management is my main field. I'm in a team that's called the Catalysts. So the idea of the Catalyst team with an X way is to, in the end, I think that's always how I put it, to help customers do the right thing. And that is different from doing things right. So typically what we try to do is come in and really help people to set up the API strategy to really understand why they're even doing APIs, to better define what they want to get out of APIs, and to help them that their API strategy and the execution of the API strategy, the API program, are successful. And that is very different in my mind from helping them to do things right, which we also do in terms of teaching about API design and helping with API lifecycle management and all these kind of things. But most importantly, we want to help them to do the right thing so that they don't start going down a road where in the end they have to say, well, that's fine. We have a lot of APIs, but for example, nobody uses them. So what good is that? So we're a small team with an X-Way and 
our main goal really is to help our success, uh, to help our customers to succeed. And we do that by consulting with them, by conducting workshops, by training teams, and often it's it's a process that works out over time where we help them to over time better understand and manage their API ecosystem. What I'll be presenting today is in part based on my work with an X-Way, but it also I want to credit my former colleagues. It's also in part based on the work that I did before. So before I joined X-Way, I was in a team called the API Academy. And back then, in 2018, we decided to write this book. It's called Continuous API Management. We did this together. Back then, my API Academy colleagues, Mehdi Mejoy, myself, Ronnie, and Mike Amundsen, Ronnie Mitra and Mike Amundsen. It was a lot of fun and a lot of work. <laughs> But it was also very rewarding. And our main goal with that book was really to tell the story how APIs need to be this continuously evolving ecosystem of decentralized pieces of software and capabilities. And we really wanted to make sure that people focus on this idea that it's important to manage individual APIs, but it's also important to manage the API, what we call landscape, so that you get the most out of your APIs. Because in the end, in most cases, when you ask people, why are you even using APIs? Well, a lot of people say, we don't quite know. Everybody's doing it, so we're doing it as well. Um, now, that's a little bit, that's not nice to say. But you, you kind of get that answer sometimes. But in most cases, what people want to get out of APIs is to increase the speed at which they can develop new products, they can innovate, they can bring products to customers, they can test out products, all these things. And APIs are essential to this, but it's also essential to use them in the right way because otherwise it really doesn't change things much. If you do what you did before, only that now you're using APIs, you haven't really changed much. Right? You changed one little thing within the technical setup, but you didn't really change the way how you do stuff. And the big change that APIs really bring about, and that's the main thrust behind all of what I'm talking about today, is that if you want to use APIs to really change the way you do stuff, you have to move your focus from building systems to designing ecosystems. So traditionally, we all have this idea that IT is building a system, right? They're integrating things. Just think about how often people talk about integrating things. They're integrating things. They're trying to build the system. And it kind of works. It has worked for a long time and it still works, but what makes the system sometimes hard to manage is that because it's so tightly integrated, it's hard to change individual bits and pieces because there are so many dependencies. And that's where APIs come in, where you say instead of doing that, we want to actually deconstruct the whole thing into individual little systems, which then are an ecosystem where all these capabilities live more independently and I can change them more easily. So that's the, I would say, the most general value proposition of APIs is this deconstruction of systems into ecosystems. Now, this is something that can be very valuable because then you can add more pieces more easily, you can change things more easily, but it's also something that sometimes really goes against some very traditional and long-held beliefs around how IT should be organized and structured. And this is something that we often encounter, in particular when we get to large organizations. And I want to talk about how you can change your mindset a little bit, which allows you to better accept basically this idea of letting go of building systems and embracing the idea of building the designing ecosystems. So when you look at what APIs really ask you to do, and not so much APIs on the technological level, but sort of, the, I don't want to say philosophical, but the idea around APIs, right, is that you say an API encapsulates some capability, 
And one of the great things about an API is that I, don't, I have no idea how somebody is implementing something. As long as they tell me how I can access it, I'm fine. Right? All I need to know is the interface. I don't need to know the implementation. That's very, that's very useful. In order to make this as powerful as possible, I also have to make sure that all my dependencies work like this. So ideally, every dependency that I have between different bits and pieces in my organization should be through APIs. And then I know all of my dependencies, they're managed, they're known, there's no hidden dependencies, which allows me to better manage this ecosystem, ecosystem of interdependent components. And another of the core ideas behind that is to say, and now that I've done that, that each of these things is individually managed, tools and practices can be picked more specifically according to the task that needs to be done. So teams can become more effective because they are have more freedom in deciding how they want to get their job done. And then going stepping back one step further, right? in the end, that is what really satisfies consumers because now you, you're able to roll out products faster, which means you can realize value faster, which means both you get more successful and your customers are more happy, so wonderful. But what this means is if you do that, you kind of lose control a little bit by right? taking things apart and allowing teams more autonomy, you have less control over how they do things. And that means that sometimes when organizations are doing that, then in particular, let's say more traditionally minded IT departments might say, we're not so sure about all of this because originally everybody developed on our platform, which meant basically in our system. And that was very nice because we controlled everything. We had approval processes and development pipelines. We had release schedules and so forth. And everything, we, we knew everything. So everything was very nicely managed. That is true. But it also often meant that things were really slow. Like you, you released software three times a year or something like this. So, so that's kind of not really what you want to do anymore. But you still want to have a little bit of control. And that's why so often people talk about governance, this idea of, OK, I get that an API-focused approach has some advantages, but we also need to have some visibility and control over what is going on. And we also want to be able to identify certain concerns that apply across products. One of the very traditional ones would be security considerations where we can help individual teams and say, OK, we know that everybody should secure their APIs. Here's a tool to do that. So not everybody needs to figure that out by themselves. And that's kind of the secret sauce of good API management at the landscape level, is balancing this autonomy and freedom, and on the other hand, also some oversight and governance so that you can help teams, that you can manage critical concerns, and that you make sure that you also have some insight into what's happening, for example, understanding dependencies and so forth. And in order to do that, I think there are some really interesting lessons that we've learned over time. So one is what I call API the APIs. What I mean by that is that if you claim that an API is very powerful because it allows you to access something through a well-defined interface, then you should also manage the API, and now it becomes a little tricky, through an API. Meaning that the API should describe itself and make certain claims about itself so that then when you look at various APIs, you can understand a little bit about what those APIs are doing, who's managing them, when was it released, when will it be decommissioned. Who can I contact? What are the dependencies? Does it store personal data? Is it, is it a cloud service? If so, which cloud does it live in? Have I control over the region in which that cloud service stores the data and so forth? All these things that you might want to govern, if that is available in the API itself, then you can build tooling and machinery around that. And that's great. 
which means that now you have taken things apart, but you can still have a unified view of what's going on. And that's what I'm trying to show in this picture, which I think by now, it has been a little while since I painted it. By now, I find it's a little busy, but it is what it is. So the more traditional view of things that originally was held, I would say, in API management is on the left-hand side, where you say, well, we have APIs. We publish those APIs through some form of API management platform. Then those management platform makes the APIs available, maybe through additional security measures and so forth. Then I might push them into a portal, and the portal then makes them available to the masses that are eagerly evading the APIs. By now, it becomes apparent that this picture is a little bit too simplistic. What you really want to do is you want to be able to have APIs which are potentially even managed in different API management solutions. For example, you have different clouds. Those clouds have different API management solutions built into the cloud. And you want to be able to accept that, and you, but you still want to be able to manage that. And then what you have is you say, for each of those APIs that get published through potentially various API management solutions, I can gain insights into those. And then I can build a unifying layer across that, which then exposes my API ecosystem to the eagerly waiting masses. So that's the idea of saying, instead of going inside out and saying every API that comes from a certain space gets exposed in a certain portal, you rather say outside in and say everybody who wants APIs, they should have access to any API regardless of where it is published, how it's published, on which platform is available. And, and then you have to make sure that this translates into a view that maybe goes into your decentralized environment. So this is really the more complete and much more powerful picture. And what you can do then are things, and I won't go into details here, just as one example of what you can do. For example, then you can start describing APIs in ways that are useful for you. And you can say, whenever I'm assembling this unified view of APIs, I may be able to not just describe technical aspects of it, but I can also make available documentation. I can make available additional metadata. I can make available whatever I need to make available, such as data about personal, uh, personal data that is being managed by services so that I can become GDPR compliant. And, and all these things that may be really important for you that you want to achieve. This idea of labeling APIs is really not all that new. If we look at regular products in the real world, you can look at food products. You can look at anything that is safety, relate, safety related. In a lot of those spaces where we use products from a large variety of sources, from different food vendors or from different, let's say, machine vendors or tool vendors. Right there. Standards were created, how you can communicate important information, such as this is a dangerous machine, be careful, wear a helmet, or this contains nuts, don't eat it when you have a nut allergy. Right? These are all important information where somebody said, we should really have a good overview of this so that people can consume these products responsibly. And this really is what is behind this API, the APIs idea. And, and in that specific case, the labels, where you say, anything that I need to make visible, I should be able to make it visible in the API so that I can then build tooling on top of it that allows people to use that information. So this idea of insights, to my mind, is really something that is very powerful and also can help a lot with this decentralization, where you say, as long as I label things properly, I don't really need to care where they come from because I'm good at labeling them. Now, the next thing that is important is to say, well, when you label things properly, you don't really need to tell me so much how you created them. All I need to know is that you do things in the right way, such as, for example, that you tell me 
we don't store any personally identifiable data. So if you if you can say that, then I don't really care as much as you how you manage your data because you don't store any data that may be a problem, let's say, in a GDPR compliance case. So that is important information. On the other hand, if you do store personally identifiable data, then I may need to know where you store it, whether you can choose a certain region for storing it so that we can comply with, with regulation and so forth. And that is this whole idea of the interfaces, where you say, mostly I want to make sure that I constrain my products as much as I have to, but as little as I can get away with. Meaning that, for example, everybody creating an API has to make a statement about personally identifiable data, because that is important nowadays. And that can get you into really expensive legal trouble if you don't manage it well. On the other hand, some other things may not be that important. And then in that case, you would tell people, we don't really care what you do there. As long as it gets the job done, that's fine. And this idea of putting constraints in place instead of creating rules. So instead of telling people how they have to do stuff, tell them what matters. You can then still give them rules and say, and if you want to do it in that way, that's fine. That's a way how you satisfy the constraint, but that's optional. As long as you satisfy the constraint, you're good. And that really allows these APIs to establish loose coupling, meaning that teams only have to play by those constraints. And how they do their job basically remains invisible to you. But one of the things that then still sometimes I think is a little bit tricky to manage is this last thing that I want to talk about very briefly is nudging. So now you've told teams, you, you have to tell us um, what your APIs are doing. You have to maybe label them. We also give you some constraints that you have to satisfy. But now you also maybe want to steer them in a certain direction. And that's what I call nudging. So nudging means that. Instead of creating rules, you create incentives. In for, in, for example, by saying you can, you have to, you have to satisfy this constraint, and you can do it any way you like. But here's a nice tool that allows you to guarantee that you satisfy this constraint. Right? That makes it much more appealing for teams, and that allows you to, for example, establish certain patterns around how teams work. This approach is something that I like to call engineering the engineers. There's a nice engineer from uh, Scott uh, Ridley, Ridley Scott movie. Sorry about that. Um, right, so the idea of saying, how can we build a system where, or an ecosystem, uh, where we have engineering teams all over the place, and now we put constraints in place that make sure that they do their work in a way that is best for the organization, because that, in the end, is the magic. And the, you want to make sure that they do the best job for the organization. And that's what you have to, to do. And that, I think, is really, in the end, the job that many of us here have is what I call APR landscaping. Right? So you're in charge of making sure that everybody creates APIs, the right APIs, creates them in a responsible way, but also creates them in a way that is best for the overall organization. And in the end, I think the best way to do that is to empower teams to make it visible what they are doing, not how they're doing it, but what they are doing, to give them constraints so that they know where they, their wiggle room is, and to also provide tooling and incentives where you can say, look, if you use this tool, that part of your constraint list is satisfied. Like you've done that. And then, for example, and, and the specific case of security in API management and API gateways is the classical case, where people said, securing APIs is actually not all that easy. So we'll put a gateway in place, and people have to go through the gateway, and then 
the securing API part is taken care of, so that's good. Nowadays, maybe things are a little more complicated because, because you have hybrid settings, you have multi-cloud settings, so some of the gateway choices become a little bit more tricky. But I think the general pattern kind of still applies in the same way. So in my mind, the magic there really is to design a platform and constantly evolve a platform where you say, this is the set of tools, the set of design time and runtime components and support vehicles that we can give to our community of API creators that helps them most effectively right now to get APIs done, to release APIs, to build new things, and to realize new revenue in the end. So that's really all that I wanted to talk about. So my main point here really was to say, it can be sometimes a little hard, but I think it's necessary to embrace this idea of an ecosystem, so to stay specific, like really explicitly say, we stop building systems, we start cultivating ecosystems. And that's a huge mind shift, depending on where you come from. And I think it takes a little bit of time to adjust to that. And I think this model of how can I do this by using insights, interfaces, and nudging, this model maybe can help you a little bit to make this step from building systems to cultivating ecosystems. And with that, I am done. Thank you very much for listening. Now I'm trying to get back to my, see, now I have a problem getting back to my slides here. No, to my, ha, here I'm back. So um, thanks very much for listening. Um, again, if you want to look at the slides, they're online. And um, if we have any questions right now, I think we, we have the general Q&A question now, session now anyway, right? And I still cannot hear you. <sighs> okay. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, now I can hear you. Good, good. So uh, <laughs> oh, good. I have one question. Not before... me. I'm happy about that. Good. <laughs> um, I have one question before moving to the Q&A session. Uh, you talked about uh, API for APIs, which is a wonderful idea because it will kind of give the chance to see everything what's being built at the organization. Do you have any suggestions how to get started with API for APIs? Because that's a big thing to start building. It's, it doesn't have to be. So, I mean, technically speaking, it's relatively easy. So what you need is you need a convention where you make that data available. So there could be something like home documents or any any other kind of, you could also embed it into open API descriptions if that's where you want to have it. So create a convention where to put this data. And then I would say start with some data that where people have a certain pain point and say, it would be nice if we knew more about this, right? So something where there is a lack of insight where people say, Ah, it's nice that we have all those APIs, but we really would like to know some extra information. And then start establishing that as a pattern where you say, please, everybody, make this information available. Put it in the open API, for example, like this. Like there's extension points in open API where you can put it or you can create your own document from it. Whatever works for you. And then um, you can build like very, very thin tooling around that and that starts harvesting this information. And then you can start seeing, you know, whether people are doing it, if not looking into why they're not doing it. I mean, then it becomes kind of a cultural thing where you have to make sure that people actually allow you to have those insights. But that's that can just be part of, you know, your general process of helping teams to make sure they do the right thing. That sounds to me like a beginnings of a minor standard. Why don't we have this as a part of, for example, open API to have some meta about the API itself? Why it's not part of open API? Yes. Well, you, you should ask Daryl. Uh, 
<laughs> I will contact them and ask. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, we have, so, I mean, a while ago, we had a presentation where we presented a standalone document format, which is a little bit more complicated, but then it's not tightly coupled with open API. I think technically putting it into open API is not, complicated um, and it, it could be a great suggestion you know I think they're still looking for suggestions what would be features for open API 4.0 that could be one yes so thank you for your talk very good points things to digest <laughs>